love that, don't mm -hmm. they? <laughs> so they oh, got a human out that. there. Mm -hmm. Well, they did. He's from a, a farm near Nashville. Oh, but, really? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. There's some change in there. Um, Patrick something. Yeah, it's, it's Patrick. Yeah, the yes. 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 It's healing well. Yeah. 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 It's back a little while. I guarantee you that's not going back fast. <laughs> I'm sure that might. This part, I'm sure it's been well, well, but this part, I don't know that it makes any sense. It makes any sense. I don't know that. Yeah. yeah. I don't they pulled it out there. Just, just relax. <laughs> yeah, there's no relax. <laughs> but you know, you said what you said all the time. And people, of course, I know they aren't very far from me, but I. Oh, it's crazy. Yeah. Hey, hey, how are you doing? Hey, how are you doing? Hey, how are you doing? It's coming. It's coming along. I hope it's not getting better. <laughs> Thank you for asking. Good. Hey, just like you get reports on me. It's, yeah. a, it's a lot better now. Exactly what exactly did you do today? I rolled up so sweet. Thank you. 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 Hi, how are you? Hey, how are you doing? Good, good. I'm doing all right today. I gotta go downstairs because that bathroom is messed up. I'll be back here. Yesterday was the first day I was doing my training. And I was like, I smell something. I, and, and I was like, oh, it smells so good. And it smells so good. And then I went and lit a candle. And then, and three weeks. And then I can finally, and then I can finally do something too. And I thought this was something so good. But no, it wasn't. It was, it was, it was, it was very sweet. But, um, they just called them they come and uh, going for somebody to Yeah, it's just it's hard uh, to Jonesboro, yeah. so yeah. I'll fill in for a film. Uh, for a funeral. Exactly. And uh, really? I've been, I think I was there one time for a meeting. Very fatigued. Yeah. Um, so I went through two rounds of antibiotics all night. So you got a four job. Oh, 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 what are really smart people saying? So you'll fit right in. The door is right there. It was, yeah. It just kept going. I went and got me. Hey, like, three, four, 
sisters in Christ Jesus. We're thankful for the tremendous love that we have for each other and for the love that you have for us. We pray, Father, we study your word today that we might divorce our minds from those things that are worldly. And we might center our minds upon our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. So before we begin, I'm going to tell you guys a little update. So remember on Sunday we talked about self-control and I talked about that delicious apple fritter. <laughs> so after we went to go eat dinner, Stacy says, I feel like something. Walk in against them, Stacy and see those delicious apple fritters. I said, I talked about that thing and bought to her and told her about, you know, self-control and went to After I got to the cash register, she said, you know what? Don't worry about it, that's on me. Oh. Oh. <laughs> so we are going to get there. Open the so door. open the door. Open the door. That's the point, right? A delicious apple fritter can open up a door for a potential Bible study. Remember that. All right. We're going to, since we get self control on Sunday, I figured we'll jump into Proverbs 16 and kind of play with this textually um, tonight. I think there's some uh, good things for us to draw. And so kind of talks and keeps the theme of what we've been talking about, ties in a few things and just solidifies what we should be focused on in life. So, we're going to... The plans of the heart belong to man, but the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. All right. What's that mean? God's in control. Very we can, interesting. We can make plans, but God's in control. We can make plans, but God's in control. Is it wrong to plan? No. It's not wrong to plan. The Bible encourages it. The Bible does encourage us to plan. Yeah. But we're foolish if we think that our plans are going to be what God wants to be the outcome. Because the Bible says God directs the steps of man. So outcomes come from God, right? I remember when Tasha was planning on going to medical school. Mm -hmm. I remember that. I remember all the plans and how she made all these adjustments and all this stuff, right? I remember her and AJ talking about planning on getting married and when they were, I remember all of that. 
And the outcome of what Tasha thought was going to happen happened, but not in the same way you thought it was going to happen, right? Completely different situation because God is the one who directs steps. And so I think there's a verse that we need to really look at. Somebody get James chapter 4, verse 13 through 17. James 4, 13 through 17. Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit. But you do not know what tomorrow will bring. But what is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. So whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. What does this mean? Somebody break that down. <coughs> Don't put your trust in your own plans. Put your trust in God's plans because you can fail and tomorrow you can say, oh, well, I didn't do this, but you really have no idea whether you're going to do it or not do it. That all depends upon God. So don't be arrogant on cocky with your statement of, well, on August the 11th, I'm going to go to Barbados. Whatever. You know, because you just don't know what you're going to do. You won't be, but I can tell you. <laughs> but when it doesn't work out, don't lose your faith in God. Yeah. Good. Good comment. Anybody else? Nobody else. So why would we lose our faith in God if we make a plan that doesn't go the way that we want it to go? You think we're in control. Yeah, it's very interesting, right? Because all of us in this room are, I'm making a broad statement, right? I hate to have to quantify, but I don't want you coming up to me after class and I'm gonna look at you and think, you knew that I was making a broad statement. Why are we having those conversations? I'm making a broad statement. This is where we get caught up, right? We're supposed to have confidence in doing things, but it is an arrogance. And we do believe that the plans that we make are gonna do it. And it really does come down to God is in control. And if you think about the that the older generation, they would always say something. See you Sunday, it's the Lord wills. Right? Lord will. We don't even think like that, but everything we do is really Lord willing, right? If the Lord wills it, if he allows it to happen, it's gonna happen. And I think what happens is we live in this generation now where we do not, and I mean times on the generation, but we do not really think through that holistically that really if the Lord, if the Lord allows something to happen, if he allows a thing to happen, it's gonna happen doesn't matter what we do. And if we keep that in our forefront and realize that really I'm nothing, you're nothing, we're just people, we're just vessels. I remember Jeff said a long time ago, um, you know, and he was talking about just the, his career path and how he grew up and, you know, going through, he said, you know what, my life would have been way different if I'd have been born to different people. Sometimes we act like we're so special, but really you were handed a silver spoon and granted opportunity that you shouldn't have failed in the first place. And we think we did something because you shouldn't have failed because you were set up for success. That's different than somebody who's set up for failure and does something to get out of that situation, right? And those people typically are the ones who recognize and say, I'm really nothing, I'm just a person, right? And so I think it's important when we start looking at this verse and then verse 17 says something. Hold on, Brian. Go ahead. I remember when adults were younger, especially Sierra, because Sierra always had to get a hard yes or hard no. There was no middle ground. And she would say, so you promise me you're going to take me to the zoo, you know, tomorrow? And then I'd be like, I can't promise you, honey. I can't make that promise, but Lord willing, we'll be able to do it. She's like, pinky promise. You yeah. know, like, what did you do? Pinky yeah. promise. But you can't because you don't know what's going to happen. And I learned, especially with telling her, when I would tell her we were going to do something and it didn't happen, she would flip out like, but you said, but you said, but you said, you know. So I think that that is something that we do have to be careful about because we make these plans, but we really don't know whether or not we're going to bring our next breath. Right. Yeah. And, and life changes, right? Life changes. That's important. And I think verse 17 is what that calls out is, therefore to him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is sin. Doesn't that seem kind of random? Right? That seems like a random statement a little bit. If you look at what he's talking about, hey, all such boasting is even all that. I think the point is, if you readily recognize that God's in control, always do what you're supposed to do, right? 
When there's good to be done, that's who we are. We are people of good, people who do good and people who are supposed to always stay focused on good. So maybe things don't look the way you want them to look, but do what God wants you to do, okay? I wrote a note in on um, verse 15. Um, you know, instead you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or that. I said, um, live in the present with God in our lives and live one day at a time with God in it. When presented with sin, I will do the next right thing. I have Psalm 35, uh, 30, 37, 5. Yeah, that's fantastic, right? Because really what she said is, my focus will be John, on today. It was probably a John is one. Yeah, yeah, right, yeah, right, <laughs> right. <laughs> right, but my focus will be today, always do the next right thing in today, and then ultimately tomorrow takes care of itself. Think that, but just recognize that every plan you make, just make them, watch what happens. It's a good example. Job was not only did he do good, but he even offered sacrifices to the king just in case. Yeah, yeah, just in case. Yeah, just in case. right. And that's what's hard for us to recognize, right? Do what's right. So I think that's very important when we look at that. All right, good comments. Verse two. Somebody read it. Wait, where are we oh, Proverbs, sorry, Proverbs 16. <laughs> Proverbs 16. All the ways of a man are pure in his own eyes, but the Lord weighs the spirit. All right. What's that mean? Yeah. Realistically judge yourself because it's easy to deceive yourself. Yeah. Anybody else have another good, good, good way to look at it? I believe that's accurate. Anybody else have any more insight? This, this speaks to our tendency to justify ourselves uh, based on you know with our reasons for doing things. But this really says that God knows what our real reasons are, what yeah. our real motives are. So here's, here's how I wrote that, right? For the most part, people think whatever they do is right. That's for the most part. God judges the reason, the reason for doing it. Go to 1 Corinthians 4.4. Because Paul writes something to the church of Corinth that when you read what he says, it's very interesting, and I want us to kind of talk about that. 1 Corinthians 4.4. 4. For I am not aware again of anything against myself, but I am not thereby acquitted. It is the Lord who judges me. Right. What's that mean? And I'm not going to read all of it. I know. I know. You know what? I'm about to start calling on people because if they don't want to go, I don't I'll read it. Right. What does that mean? What, what he says, the church in first one. Can you read it one more time, John? <laughs> it, it means that we can deceive ourselves and, and right. we can fool ourselves about what our real motives are, but we cannot fool God. He yeah. always knows. Yeah, and I think what he's saying is. Yes, a little bit deeper, if you want to just think about this, if we all think about this, I don't know if I'm doing anything wrong, but that doesn't make me right. Paul had a clear conscience when he was persecuting the church. Exactly. He thought that he was doing the right thing. Right, and it doesn't make me right, right? And that's, and, I, and so thank you for bringing that up, Peggy, because I think that's where we sometimes get to a place where we feel okay. My conscience is clean. It doesn't make us right. <clears throat> conscience does not make us right. And sometimes what we do is we justify a thing because my conscience, right? You can train your conscience, right? You can train your conscience. You can train your conscience to do good. You can train your conscience to allow things to happen. I know people who outright think it is okay, justifiable, to kill somebody else for being disrespected. Disrespected. Believe that wholeheartedly. And so when we start thinking about that, who's right and who's wrong? There's a standard, right? And so I think when we get messed up, because we'll turn around and we'll say, hey, at the end of the day, I know I'm right. I'm convinced that I'm right. What convinces us that we're right? How are you convinced that you're right? Because Paul's saying, look, just because I don't think I've done anything wrong doesn't make me right. So how do you know that you're right in the things that you do? We have a standard for right and wrong. Say it again? We have a standard for right. Yeah, but John, I'm going to throw out and say I don't think everybody reads the standard. Oh, I don't think they do either. 
So that means but it that it doesn't change that we have a standard. Oh, that's so interesting, right? <laughs> it doesn't change that we have a standard, and so we will sometimes use that. Hey, I didn't know. I didn't. I didn't read that. I didn't go. And it's very interesting that it says that in times past God winked at ignorance, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. Right? We don't have. We are without excuse, and I think that's where we often get messed up when it comes to the Bible. The whole purpose of Jesus coming was to save and remove excuse. To save, draw men towards him, and to remove any excuse that there's no way to him. And so if he's the way, the truth, and the life, here it comes. Cindy, you are going to comment. Well, I was just saying, it's kind of iffy if you obey your parents and they're not right. Mm -hmm. Right. Other people in authority, the same thing. It's easy to say, yeah, but there are a lot of times when sometimes we do because that's what we've been taught mm -hmm. by a high authority. Right. Yeah. And, and what do we do? Yeah, well, we have to go back to God's word. Right. Right. And that's and that's the point. So the point is we sometimes do out of just doing, but we have to make sure what we're doing is right. And I think that's the that's the thing. You can be right and you're wrong, but God is going to judge the reason for doing it. So does that mean that you can do something wholeheartedly and you have good intentions in doing it? I think this is a very easy thing. I, I'll use doctrine, right? I think there's a lot of things that are point blank doctrine, and there's no question. And I think Romans 14 shuts that down quickly, right? Somebody who thinks that there you can eat meat and somebody who thinks that you can. That is not a doctrinal thing. That is a judgment thing, and that's a God says both of them, right? Calls one of them weaker, but he says both of them, hey, don't judge another man's servant. We'll try to throw that blanket on everything. That blanket does not apply to everything. When it comes to doctrine, outright 100%, God has locked this thing down. Locked it down. I'll give you an example, right? Here's an easy example. It's funny because we were talking, we were, we were planning on talking through this as elders, but I'll just give you guys insight. I think it's very simple. When the Bible talks about withdrawal, what does that mean? To disassociate yourself, go away. Okay. And socially. All right, socially, right? All right. Does the Bible give us any more commands of how to deal with brethren who are not part of this local congregation? No. No. Anybody want to challenge that? Ooh, this is interesting. What's your question? Does the Bible go ahead. Does the Bible give us any uh, I forgot how I worded it. Does it tell us how to deal with other people who are not part of this congregation, basically, that are Christians? And I heard no. So you well, said, with respect to with, with respect to withdraw. With respect to withdraw. Yeah, with respect to withdraw. Right. And your answer was Well, no, I was gonna say if somebody has withdrawn themselves from this congregation, can you withdraw from them? Okay. Is where you're going to go? No. The, where I'm going to go is, <laughs> no, no, this is very simple, right? We want to throw a blanket statement on withdrawal. I'm going to give you guys this. Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians 5 that if there's any brother who does yada, 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 don't even be around that brother. It doesn't matter if they're in the congregation or not. That is a general principle for Christians. Hey, if there's somebody who, who teaches false doctrine, who's a Christian, and they're teaching false doctrine, don't even associate with that person. He locks this down of people who are going to the extreme who are perverting the truth. I'm not talking about withdrawal. This is where we always draw it and say, well, and I say this to say, if we have Christians who are walking in air teaching false doctrine, we're commanded to only interaction we should have is try to teach them and bring them back not hang out and act like everything's okay. And he even says that even if an angel, an angel comes to you and teaches another doctrine, let him be accursed, right? And so we'll get all this, we'll say, well, I don't know how it should act in things and I don't, again, the standards are already set. What we do is look at those standards and we start saying, well, here it is, and this thing starts getting tricky, and it's not really tricky, it's just hard. It's hard. My brother's doing that to the extreme, because my sister got divorced and remarried, helped fix her. He's just... Right. That's, but, but which is not what we're taught, right? And yeah. again, this becomes important. What's our mission? We can't hang out and have fun out like nothing's wrong. We have to try to pull our brothers and sisters out of the fire. 
Okay. And I'd be like, you have a scripture, then it's like, you have a scripture and somebody else may too. Or were you, nope, you're good? No, I'm just saying that Paul was not a member of the church in Corinth. Right. But he told them, you know, to withdraw yep. yourself from this man. Mm -hmm. I cannot believe this. And yep. withdraw. He was not a member there, but he right. told them what to do. Right. Because they were sitting there and he said, what are you doing? He must be puffed up and upset. Why are you guys, so you guys disassociate yourself, right? But he wasn't, he said he was, he's already judged this man in spirit. Right. The thing we have to understand is we can withdraw from people who are members here, but we have action that we must take for anybody who is teaching false doctrine that is a Christian. Or they're doing things living in sin. The Bible is very clear. So we'll try to juggle that and say, well, they haven't been withdrawn from because they're not a member here, but God's very clear on what our action should be. Why do I say that? Because we'll sometimes think we can be friends with people that we really should not be hanging around friends with. And the Bible's clear on that. So I want to talk about standards, right? All right. Any comments before I jump to verse 3? Nope. All right. Proverbs 16, 3. Commit your works to the Lord, and your plans will be established. All right. What's that mean? That the Lord will. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's very, it's very interesting. So, what does that mean? Your plans will be established. Pray about it. Make a wise decision. Hopefully, will you be successful if you always commit your ways to the Lord? Yeah, I'll say yes. Spiritually, yeah. In the wrong way. Yeah. Well, well, even here, spiritually, you will always be successful. Right. You know what our problem really is? We want to be successful on it. Look, is there anybody here who does not want to be successful here on earth? Right. We all want to be successful. And so we start serving God and then we want to see because I'm doing right, because I'm serving you, God, because of this, your Bible, your word says I have a we have a family Bible study uh, with the men. I think I told you guys we meet like every three weeks of my family and we just get in there and we're studying word and blah, blah, blah. You would be shocked how many times I hear people talk about. God's promise is that if we're faithful to him, he's going to bless us abundantly more than what we think. And he's going to open up doors and pour out treasures we're not able. I was born, I was raised like that, by the way. Treasures that we're not able to receive because God says that he wants to see his people successful and doing blah, 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 blah. And it's all monetary. And guess what? That's never what God was about. Never. But that's what we're trained to think because we think we're supposed to have stuff. And we're supposed to have power and we're supposed to have all this goodness and it's crazy because <laughs> his most valuable trusted workers in the kingdom had nothing in fact when go you may not even have a place to lay your head right i'll make sure you're taken care of that's what they were told but we think that there's a twist to that and everybody should be like solomon and so what this verse is saying when you look at wisdom commit your works to the Lord and your thoughts will be established is what my version says but that means that you'll be successful think about it if you're good in your mind will you always be good you will if you're always right on God focus on God here you will always be good because you'll learn to be content then Paul I don't know how Paul did it I get your head Mitzi Paul said I was beaten shipwrecked all this other stuff blah blah blah, blah. but in every situation I learned to be content he called that a lot of friction also. Yeah, yeah. I don't even understand Paul. Don't want to understand him really. Not to that level, but yeah. Light affliction. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, that was my point. Is this verse to me is um, being content and being at peace. Uh, yeah. You're at peace because you know you're walking with God. Things might not always go your way, but you know you're going God's way. It's just a peace in living. Yeah. When you follow God, you just see, oh, no, it's just peaceful. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, it's, the Bible says it'll bring a peace that surpasses all understanding. I remember seeing our life in turbulence many times, and me and Stacey talking, Stacey like, Brent, did you sin? No. I haven't sinned either. Look, <laughs> if, are we serving God? Yep. Have we done? Nope. Then guess what? God is going to bring us through this. Right? I think the reason a lot of people in this world believe that if they put their faith in God, they'll be like, successful and have a lot of because a lot of churches people <laughs> preach that, mm -hmm. you know, uh, the Joel team and you yeah. know, all these other big uh, big name people. Yeah. If you go and listen to their services, if you go and listen to them, it's 
all about, you know, if you go to Texas and all these you know, mega churches, churches, churches in Texas, yeah. they're everywhere. Right. And that's what it is. Right. If you push your faith in Jesus, you will be successful. You'll have this. Right. So you get thousands of people that go and listen to these people. Right. And they're just feeding their ears with stuff that they want to hear. Right. So. And, and, and you know what's interesting about that? We get why they're messed up on that. I don't get why we are. That's true. Because I will just tell you, we will not participate, not participate, let me just be clear, can't find teachers, can't find people to help, can't find people to do, we have the same rotation of individuals because everybody always has a reason, oh, when it comes time that somebody needs something, help, can you show up, we have the same group of people who come, or hey, when people want to know where you've been, how come, what's going on, can we help? Busy with everything but God. That's the cycle. And here's the problem because, and I just, this is the beauty of being a teacher. The beauty of being a teacher is you either are or you're not walking in the light. If it hits you, then it's meant for you. If it didn't, it's not. And at the end of the day, we'll turn around and we'll talk about how great God is, how holy God is, how much God has done in our lives and all this. And the question you have to ask ourselves, if our thoughts are focused on him, is how much are you doing for God in your life? Not how much he's did for you in, in your life. How much are you doing for God in your, how much of your life is consumed about God and his people and the work of God? Because at the end of the day, we're all going to stand before God and we're going to say, God, I did this and blah, blah, blah. And we're going to look at every missed opportunity. And this is so tricky because we'll let stuff get in the way and we have excuses of the reason why. And there's no excuse, right? There's no true excuse. The excuse is, I'm choosing Brent rather than you today, God. Let me just tell you the truth. And when the Bible comes and says that God is, all the ways of a man are pure, but in his own eyes, but God weighs the spirits, verse 2. God weighs the intentions, the reason. God knows what the real answer is. Guess what? It was about me and not about you. Let me be straight up. And I think if we were to articulate that to God, it would really make it resonate with us. But I'm never going to say that because in my own mind, I'm right. I have a reason. I'm justified. And God's saying, are you really justified? It's interesting you think you're justified, but there are things I get that there were some times you could not. And I'm not saying you have to do everything, but there are some times you absolutely could have and you chose not to. And the verse we read in verse 17 of, uh, let me make sure you guys get it, uh, James chapter four, verse 17, to him who knows to do good and doesn't do it, it's okay. Don't your verse says? And what does it call it? It is sin. I'm just saying. I know y'all hate sometimes when I teach. Go ahead. I have a few things. I was going to say, I think um, regarding that, we justify it when we know we're supposed to do something and we just, oh, well, this came up, this came up, I can't do that, I can't do blah, 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 blah. And we say, well, God's really not going to send me a help because I didn't just do this one thing. And we justify it. We even try to go on God's grace. Well, God, he'll be okay. He understands you know, what it is that I'm going through or why I said no or, or whatever it is. Because I'm going to tell you, I do that in my own mind all the time where there's something that I know that I should be doing, but I put it off for something else. And then I'll say, well, God will be okay. He'll be okay with it. You know, and you justify that in your head. And so that's mistake number one. And then I was going to say about the people, you know, serving God out of what they can get out of God. And the whole point is serving God, and he's and it talks about him giving you treasures and all of these things, but that's spiritual. You know, if you stay with the Lord, if you walk with the Lord, then he will bless you with these things. A lot of that is spiritual. We have to look at that spiritually minded and say, you know, I may not have what it is on earth, but I know God has got something for me in heaven. Right. Right. And you know it's interesting, so I think that's kind of a segue into verse 4. Somebody read verse 4 for me. The Lord hath made all things for himself, yea, even the wicked and the many of evil. All right. So this is important for us to grasp, right? It's, it's, it's important for us to grasp, but it's also difficult. It's difficult for me to grasp, right? Because we agree, we establish God's in control. No question. I think everybody has that, right? 
And we establish that the Lord has a plan for everything. But what about the wicked? Because this verse is saying that, look, God has a plan for everything, and the wicked will not go unpunished. The challenge is that sometimes that may bleed over to instances that happen to Christians. There may be some pain sharing for Christians, and we have to suffer because of evil people. So we're not exempt from evil and the impact of evil and getting hurt by evil and all of that. But what the Bible tells us, God is in control. There's a plan for every, uh, he has a plan for everything. And the wicked will not get away. They're going to get punished. For Brent, that is difficult. I'm speaking for myself. Because when if I know somebody is wicked or somebody is evil, right, I sometimes want to see that happen quicker. That's Brent. I'm not God, though. And so I got to be very careful not to intervene where God is the one who's going to bring it all because God has a plan. And sometimes I can, I can get in the way and uh, slow down God in his doing if I don't just do the right thing that we talked about, right? Thank you, that's written down in our Bible. Say it again. Vengeance is mine. Yes, that's what the Lord says. Sometimes I want to see it because I have my, how could this happen, right? But God's saying, get out of the way and watch me do. And so that becomes very important. In Isaiah 40, 31, somebody get that for me. Yet those who wait for the Lord will gain new strength. Yeah. And uh, they will mount up with Wings like eagles had to turn the page. Yeah, had to turn the page. They will, they will run and not get tired, and they'll walk and not come weary. Think about it. We need to wait on the Lord. And God says he's going to lift us up, and we're going to have wings like eagles. He's going to take care of all this. And we all want to see that day where we see God, our faith really becomes sight, right? We all think we have faith. Could you imagine what you're really going to understand once it's all revealed? It's going to be mind-boggling. I truly believe if God pulled back the curtain and we saw life as it really exists, we would be so, we would be messed up. Now we'll understand it in the end by and by, but this whole thing of verse 4 is telling us that God, let me go back, uh, oops, that's Proverbs. Somebody read verse 4 for me again while I'm, I'm not taking it too long. The Lord has made everything for his own purposes, even the wicked for the day of evil. Even the wicked for the day of evil. So what's important for that is, what does God call wicked? What, what's defined as wicked? Sin. Now go back and put yourself back in that situation, right? I can think I'm right, but I'm really not. God knows my intentions, boom. And at the end of the day, he's saying, look, he's even, even for the wicked. Isn't our challenge sometimes that we call wicked what we want to call wicked, but not something that's, I mean, I can be wicked by lying, right? I can be wicked by not treating my brother right. I can be wicked by not forgiving. I can be wicked by not doing a lot of things, right? I'll say it like this. To get to heaven, you have to be intentional. To get to hell is very unintentional. I just think about wickedness being continuing mm -hmm. rather than just an instance. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I, I agree. Okay. But but if I am a liar or unrepenting, I mean, yes. Like if, you, if you've done bad to your brother, yeah. that is a sin. You've done right. a sin. But right. I'm not sure that that makes you a wicked person. So a, a person who's unforgiving. Say it again? Yeah. Exactly. Because that's the point, right? Yeah. If I have not corrected it, right. Yeah, continue in, right? So if we walk in the light, and I think that's where, you know, you will often hear my sister here talk about God's grace, and I agree with her. God's grace is wonderful. But the verse is very simple. It's about our daily walk. In our daily walk, you may mess up. But the loop that God created of, of repentance should bring you back right to God. If it doesn't bring you back and you decide, I'm not going to forgive Peggy, but I'm going to do everything else. Well, I'm wicked because I'm walking in sin because how can I have this against my sister that I do see and say I love the Lord who I don't see? And so that is where it gets tricky because we turn around and we'll not address stuff. We have a narrow path to follow and then there's a broad path that yes. leads to destruction. 
both of those take action. You have to actively follow a path. Yep. Would you agree that sin is stepping off the path? But if we choose to actively follow that broad path, that's when that's when we're the problem. I, I love what you said so much. I'm going to use it as a segue into verse 17. Read it for me. Proverbs uh, 16, 17. The highway of the upright is to depart from evil. He who keeps his way preserves his soul. All right. So he's talking about this highway, this path, right? The path of the upright. What's that mean? What's the word upright mean? The righteous. Yeah. The morally right. The path, the highway. So Jake just brought up this path. The path for the morally right is to avoid evil. Don't avoid it, and the whole thing is you have to avoid it. That's the point. But I think we lie to ourselves and tell ourselves, Oh, I can handle a little evil, I can handle a little bit, I can get away with a little bit of evil. Yes, how much time I got? I'm gonna try to wrap up this thing. You're spot on. Is your hand going to get you? All right, spot on. You ready? I can handle it. Y'all know the noun there, the first place of thing. Y'all remember that from school? Yeah, first place. Evil, it could be evil in a person, evil at a place, evil in a thing. Watch this. I can handle it. That's what you said? Yeah, that's All what right. you said. Verse 18. Somebody read that. Pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit before fall. All right. So let's make sure we get it. On this other path, you have this first step, this proud thought. And then a few steps of uh, pridefulness. And guess what? You arrive at destruction. Okay? Somebody get, turn your Bible to 2 Samuel 11, 1 through 5. Unless you repent. Yeah, I'm just talking about those who don't come off, right? We all established you can get off that path. You don't have to stay on that path. 2 Samuel 11, 1 through 5. <laughs> now it came to pass in the spring of the year at the time when the kings go to battle that David sent Joab and his servants with him and all of Israel. And they destroyed the people of Ammon and besieged Rabba, but David remained in Jerusalem. Then it happened one evening that David arose from his bed and walked on the roof of the king's house. And from the roof he saw a woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful to behold. So David sent an inquiry about the woman, and someone said, Is that not Bathsheba, the daughter of Elam and the wife of Uriah the Hittite? Then David sent messengers and took her, and she came to him, and she lay with her, for she was cleansed from her impurity, and she returned to her house. And the woman conceived, so she sent and told David, and David and said, I am your child. All right. Why did David take Bathsheba? Child. Because he could. That's pride. I'm going to do something because I can and I want to. doesn't matter what was told to me, what I shouldn't do. I'm going to do what I want to because I'm big and bad enough to do it. And that's who David was. He was big and bad enough to do what he wanted to do. And this whole thing, when you really look at it, God is saying, look, I'm the one who directs steps. You don't do anything by your own accord. You do it because I allow it to happen. I'm the one who directs. Don't ever get so haughty, Brent, that you think that you're the one pulling strings because you don't pull nothing. I'm God who makes everything, and I direct the steps. You be obedient to me, and if you know to do right and do good, you do that. Because at the end of the day, whenever you do something contrary because you can, then guess what you just did? You stepped out of your lane. And if you don't get course corrected and get back in line with me, there's going to be consequences. And I'm very clear on what that is. There's destruction that comes because of your prideful steps to think that you can because that's who you are. I'm going to pull you back in line. I may first do it with the pebble, then I'm going to do it with the rock, then I'm going to do it with the boulder, and then you're just going to get smacked because you don't pay attention. It is so clear, Stacey. No, I'm not going to. You're going to? But, I mean... I would hope nobody in this congregation is overworthy of these men. But this same thing can happen as David. He was a good guy. Yep. That's what we have to be careful. Right. Walking the godly life, we can still get ourselves. 
Well, let's ask some questions about David. How did David get caught up in the first place? Where was he supposed to be? He was in a place he wasn't supposed to be. He wasn't supposed to be at the crib. He was supposed to be at war. Those who know to do good and don't do it, to them, I don't know why he wasn't there, but guess what? He should have been where he's supposed to be. Nothing wrong with David getting up, walking on the roof of the house. That's not a sin. Where David messed up is he wasn't where he should have been. Right? I remember there was a commercial growing up. I don't know if you guys had it in Cali. And he used to come up in and say, it's 11 o'clock. Do you know where your children are? You guys used to have that commercial? Or 10 o'clock. 10 o'clock. Channel 3. You know what? We should play that at 9 o'clock on Sundays. It's 9 o'clock. Do you know where the members are? <laughs> <laughs> Y'all know that was so cold. We got to be where we're supposed to be. There's somebody who needs help. You know where the Christians are? There's somebody who needs support. You know where the Christians are? We have to be where we're supposed to be. Where David, a good guy, the Bible says a man after God's own heart. You know why he got caught up? He wasn't where he was supposed to be. I can tell you, in my in Brent's life, many of the percentage of time is because I was in a place I wasn't supposed to be, and I thought I could handle it, just like you said. Where were you supposed to be? Where was I supposed to be? Where was he supposed to be? At war. That's what verse 1 says. <laughs> Phil, that's actually a beautiful point, because we should be at war all the time. Let me give you some. Oh, gee, Phil. <laughs> We're supposed to be at war in the field fighting, and sometimes we don't do it. We're at the house laid up. That's a sermon. Hey, that'll bad preach. Back. Say it again. We're a bad back. Yeah. Well, you know. But again, right? It may be factual. This is the beauty about God. I want to say this because this is important. God knows and Phil knows if Phil is able to get up. That's why we don't judge this man because we, we're not... Who are we to judge another man's servant? We can encourage him. We can ask him. We can do all of that. But if Phil says his back is messed up, it's not Brent's duty to say, Phil's back is good. Now he could have come. He's a liar. Yeah. He's out. We shouldn't do that. Go. But you know that the interesting thing, no matter why Phil's gone or I'm gone, mm -hmm. when we're not with the saints, we're weak. And that's the reason we need to be busy. Yes. Uh, the longer I'm with, the more I'm convinced. It doesn't make it. Somebody says I'm working. That's not the point. Mm -hmm. The point is you aren't with the saints. Right. And if we're not with the saints, we're getting weaker. Yeah. And uh, we need the saints to come to us. Right. And, and all day. And, and you know what? That's a beautiful point. If you can't be here, go somewhere. If you're traveling, assemble with the saints. Because we're commanded to assemble with the saints. I think we missed that, right? Assemble with the saints. If you got to work in the mornings, got it. Go somewhere with somebody Sunday night because the whole point is for that, for us to be edified and strengthened and go through. And whenever, look, I, I know only a few who say that they became stronger during COVID. I was not one of them by any means. I was not one. There is a difference of coming and being around people who challenge and question and ask, and you hear input and you're going, and you see that other people are out there at war where they should be, and you're like, oh, I'm not the only one? That that does something to the psyche. That log out of the fire, that thing. Yes. Yeah. And, yep. and we should feel guilty that we're not here. Absolutely. And it should hurt our heart that we're not here. And we if you don't it. feel guilty about it, then you have a problem. Yeah. That, that, yeah, there's many checks and balances to your point that we can look at amongst ourselves to realize where are we at. I would tell Brett sometimes too that sometimes, and he will go through this, you just don't want to go. Yep. You just don't feel like it, but it's not about you. Right. And when you go, you're there to encourage your brothers and sisters. Secondly, yep. first of all, to worship God. But you always end up coming out a little bit better. Yeah. In fact, we're commanded to go to stir up love and good work. Commanded. So think about it. That's a command. And that's why people don't get caught up on the assembly. The command is go and stir up love and good works amongst one another. Aha, uh -huh, that's the trick. And by doing that, then it's going to work and help me as well, right? 
So if I'm not going to love you enough to do what God said do, the problem really is with me. Because I keep thinking I'm supposed to come here about me. I'm not. I'm supposed to come here about you, God and you. Yes. <laughs> the world encourages you to, to, to miss on Sunday. If it's, a, if it's a job situation, some companies will pay double time yep. instead of time and a half. When I was in public accounting long ago with a national firm, if you work so many hours on a weekend, you were able to charge a meal allowance. And the meal allowance was more on a Sunday right. than a Saturday. So there's people that conscientiously mm -hmm. chose to work and get their hours in on Sunday versus Saturday. Right. So it's, the world's not going to encourage you. They're going right. to try to make it financially an incentive for you to uh, work on Sunday versus being where you need to be. Right. A good, good comment. And I'm not just harping on Sundays only because we have Wednesdays too. I commend you for being here. But when the saints assemble, we're supposed to assemble to serve love and good works. So don't be like David at the house, be on the battlefield, where God said to be. Thanks for that nugget, Phil. <laughs>